This is part two of two of my discussion with Dr. Keita Pensa, emergency medicine physician and host of the educational podcast, Doctors in Litigation, The L Word, a narrative-style series about the psychological and practical preparation for malpractice litigation. We continue the discussion about how deposition is an audition for the trial and how important it is to play the part of the doctor everyone would want, not an arrogant physician who feels that they know the medicine better than everyone. At trial, your goal is to be the caring, compassionate, knowledgeable doctor that the jury would want as their doctor. Then we talk about what dancing with the stars has to do with her trial. It's not a non sequitur, I promise. We also discuss how this influenced her practice and how she got back to loving medicine again. Dr. Gita Pensa is an associate professor with the Brown Emergency Medicine Residency. She joined Brown's academic faculty in 2014 after 13 years in community emergency medicine practice. And in 2015, she launched Brown EM's educational blog, as well as the Brown EM podcast series. She created and serves as the host editor of AEM Early Access, a collaborative podcasting project from the Academic Emergency Medicine Journal at the Brown EM Residency. Dr. Pensa is Associate Director of Brown's Emergency Digital Health Innovation Program and co-developed Brown's new Digital Health and Innovation Fellowship Program. You can find her on Twitter at Gita Pensa, MD. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Well, something else that you had mentioned in your podcast was that when you approached the deposition initially, you were thinking of it in terms of that you understood this better than anyone else because you understood the medicine and that made you come off as arrogant. Yes. It does not sit well with a jury. So that gets back to the whole theater that you're talking about, that in the yes. optics. Yes. I I was still thinking that medicine was at the root of all of this. And again, it's not. And there was a time when my attorney said to me, you got to stop acting like you're the smartest person in the room. And I said, you know what? About this particular thing, I am. I am the smartest person in the room about this. I am Probably a person. bunch of other stuff too, but well, that doesn't mean. <laughs> you don't want to go there. I mean, like he certainly knows the law, but I know medicine. And I, I just couldn't, I, I couldn't let that go. It's the one thing that I felt like I had control over. You enter this world, you don't know what the hell is going on but you know medicine. And I just continually felt this need to defend myself and defend my care and explain why things were wrong and just had to keep getting hit over the head with the like, that doesn't matter. That None of that matters. Like we're going to distill this down into something that people can understand. We're going to have our themes, but you got to cut this out. You need to be more of what a jury would want to see in a doctor. and. You know, I finally I finally got there. But yeah, they are, you know, the deposition is not just an investigation into what happened and not just the plaintiff's attorney's attempt to get you to say things that you don't really mean or that they can use at trial later. It is everybody in the room sizing you up as what you would look like at trial. So your goal, while deflecting a lot of you know, questions and and trying not to say too much that can be used against you. Your goal really is to look the part of the perfect doctor, whatever you, whatever you think that the lay person thinks of them as knowledgeable, confident, concise, caring, humble, a servant, someone who cares about what happened to the plaintiff, someone who cares about how, what they do, what they do affects other people probably all the things that you bring anyway to your job, but you've got to learn how to let those things shine. And at deposition, you're letting that kind of come out, but with being kind of guarded in your answers. A trial, you are doing that and you're teaching the jury about your decision-making and your thought process and the actual events. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to tell your story at trial. At deposition, you're trying to keep it pretty close to the vest, but still exuding that I am a confident, caring doctor that the jury is going to want to see the stand. And in, actually in the podcast 
that is coming out this week. For the audience, it came out already. That's uh, okay. Yeah, so this isn't come out for a few weeks. So. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. So the one that I'm I'm just about to release, which will have been released by the time this comes out, it starts off with a voicemail from a nurse that I work with who called me from work to say there is a juror from your trial here, and he's looking for you, and he wanted to tell you that he, you know, basically he thinks you're great and he has a hug for you. And he always thought that you were innocent is the the word that he used. But I've had two other jurors come to the emergency department and- And it's ask, a civil trial. It's not, it's not innocent or yes, guilty. Right. So it's right, not innocent or guilty. It. That's why I put that caveat yeah. there, but that's, that's the word he used. But I've had two other jurors come to the emergency department and ask for me by name. And that's what you want when you testify at trial. You want people to hear your testimony and want you to be their doctor. That's what you want. Oh, and so, that is an excellent way to put it. I love that. I love that. You want the jury to think, man, I I, th- I would love to have this doctor as, I would love for this person to be my doctor. Yes, that's what you want. Yeah. And so um, in, in deposition, you're letting a little of that show. You are showing them that you are you know, you're, you're ready, you're in fighting shape, but you're, you know, you, you know how to act, how to comport yourself. My attorney, he compared it to my fair lady with me is that if you, if you know my fair lady, they have to turn this person who's really like rough around the edges into a lady. And, um, and that is what had to happen with me is that they really like turned me into someone who could do this, but it was a project. I was a project and, um, it paid off, but it I was a project. And so, Learning how to do that will help your case immensely in, in a couple of ways. You know, not everybody wants to go to trial. Some people are like, I just want to throw something under the bus and settle because I don't want to deal with this. But you will get a much more favorable settlement, first of all, if you look good, right? Everyone's just weighing these various options. You want to at least look like you would be a threat to take to trial, that they could lose big if you were on the stand. You want to at least give that impression. And if there's numerous defendants, and there's a chance that you're going to be dropped, your deposition is going to be the thing that makes that plaintiff's attorney think like, okay, this doctor, I don't want on the stand because they're going to make me look bad. So if you have a prayer of getting dropped, you want to really perform well at your deposition. So not only with your choice of words and how you answer your questions and how you avoid their traps and how, you know, how clever you are about these things because, you know, two people can play these games, but in how you comport yourself and them thinking like, gee, what would this person look like on the stand? And is this a person that the jury is going to look at and think like, oh, it'd be nice if they were my doctor. They don't want that. Wow. A lot to consider and a lot, again, that we were not taught in medical school. Exactly. So, so your trial, you had two trials, right? So was there anything that you would have done differently in either case? Aside from just, as you mentioned now, the way that you comport yourself, right? That's, but is there anything specific about the case, how the case was handled that you think either way, or even contrasting the, did you have, did you have the same lawyer for each trial? I did. I had the same okay. lawyer. He was an excellent lawyer. <laughs> He's so interesting to me. You get to know these people pretty well, working with them for however many years. And he's a great at what he does. When I started off with him, I didn't like him. I don't know, maybe he's listening to this. I don't know, but I didn't like him because I think I mentioned that he was a military guy. He he had been a Marine and he was not having my baloney <laughs> at all. Yeah. Um, and you were so, a mess. You needed a hug. You needed someone to talk to. I wanted he was a not hug. Not that he, guy. He was not that guy. Not that guy, but so good at what he did. So yes, I had the same attorney all the way. I, in terms of uh, strategy, they were two completely different trials. The plaintiff had a completely different argument the second time around, which they're really not supposed to do, but they just, they realized that the first trial, they lost, they lost, they lost, and their whole premise was, it was just an unwinnable premise. It it just couldn't, couldn't happen the way they were saying it should have happened. And the jury could see that. For the second one, they completely changed tactics. And so we were trying to play catch up in that way. And it, it got really ridiculous. If you want to hear some testimony, there's in the second podcast about experts and test liars, there is actual testimony from my trial, which is, I think it's, it's just ludicrous. Um, it is. It is. But I think in terms of, of my own self, the biggest change between the first trial and the second trial was my mental health surrounding them. And in the first trial, this was before I'd really started 
trying to learn more about this process and its effect on physicians and reading any of these books or anything like that, I managed somehow to pull things off. I'm sure I was not awesome at testifying, but somehow they still they still sided with me. I didn't make any huge gaffes. I think I, I performed well enough. But the toll it took on me as a person, you know, this is four weeks of trial. I can't tell you how many months leading up to it that I was just, you know, physically, oh, my, my stomach, my anxiety, I had no sleep. I, I think I talked about how I was at home. I just was this complete stress bucket for a long time. And I think of the two trials as a, a little bit of a social experiment with an N of one, you know, trial A, intervention, trial B. And the intervention was that I finally started talking to people, learning about this, learning how to manage my stress, understanding the psychological manipulation that happens during this, understanding, you know, reframing how I thought about the whole thing, changing the things I did at work. All of these things kind of played into it. And by the time I was going to trial the second time in 2018, I was way better. I was way better at this. I knew what I was doing. I knew what to expect. I was teaching other people about it. I had invited my residents to come watch me testify. And only a few took me up on it, but they did. You know, The ones that did, I think, thought that it was incredibly informative. They hadn't even been in a courtroom before, so it was a huge thing for them. I, and this is, this is sort of a funny thing. Like I, I knew leading up to it that I'd been doing well, but a few months, you know, about six months before, I and I haven't told this story yet. I told it on on CME podcast for someone else, so this may be new to you too. About six months before I went to trial the second time, I had the foresight to think like, okay, I'm I'm going to need something extra to get me through these next few months. I I know it's going to be hard on me. I expect that I'm going to try and take care of my sleep and my wellness and eat right and do some things for me, take some time for me. I'm going to try to do all of those things, but I need a little something extra. And I was contemplating what that might be. And then a friend of mine emailed me this invitation to participate in a yearly charity in Rhode Island called Dancing with the Doctors. And it's basically like Dancing with the Stars. They team you up with a professional ballroom dancer and you train for a few months and then you compete at a big gala, like a thousand people, and you're fundraising for a particular medical related cause. And this year it was the, that year was the Rhode Island Free Clinic. And I was going to delete it like I did every other year. And then I noticed that the date of the gala was a week before my trial was supposed to start. And I kind of mulled it over for a while and I thought, you know what? Maybe this is the thing. And I signed, I signed up. That signed was up. your something extra? That was my something Ballroom extra. dancing? Was I signed up to do ballroom dancing? <laughs> and, you're right, and you know, right, you're preparing for the theater. So what do you do? You perform. Exactly. Right? Like I would think I, something like uh, going to improv sessions or something like that would be help equally you, right? helpful, right? Because then you it just was, practice that, you, you practice that muscle. You, you it was great. Muscle. It was great. It was just this really wonderful, positive distraction. I was so consumed by, I, did, I don't dance, you know, and I, they matched me up with this guy who was the three-time national champion of the Czech Republic. When I say, if he could dance like nobody's business and I was like, <laughs> I, got, I got to learn how to do this. And so it was incredibly challenging. I was practicing my steps all the time at home. I never wear heels. And so now I'm trying to learn how to dance in heels. And there's this like horribly skimpy dress that I didn't realize if you pick a fast dance, you're going to wear a small dress. And I was like, I wanted to be downing like bottles of Merlot and sleeves of Chips Ahoy. And I was like, oh my God, I got to get in this dress. <laughs> I <have> to... <laughs> so I was really far more consumed about this ballroom dancing competition than I was about going to trial. And it turned out that, you know, I was a lot more open about things the second time. All of the nurses I work with, all the staff, they knew why I was doing this. And I was, I was shaking down every single person I knew for money because I wanted to, I wanted to win the fundraising component um, in addition to, you know, dance well. And the night of the gala a third of the one of the community hospitals, I still work at that little community hospital. I work at some of the other big tertiary care hospitals too now, but a third of that staff came to watch this gala and they made signs and they all knew why I was doing it. And they were so incredibly supportive. And uh, I did win, by the way. And I raised $25,000 for the free clinic all on my own because I was, I was consumed by this. I just wanted, all I wanted to do was just 
pour whatever stress and energy I had into this. It just displaced all of my stress. And, and so I did win and it was this tremendous night and my, my daughters were there and my husband was there and they all knew why I was doing it. And it was just such a wonderful night. And then a week later, I went into trial and I was like, I was still riding that. I was still riding this awesome wave of, of love and affection and goodwill and the people that I work with supporting me and saying like, we can't wait till you're back at work. And, you know, some of those people showed up in court too. You know, they showed up in court uh, the jury afterwards, when they asked them about it, were impressed by the fact that, you know, these medical people were showing up for the defendant. Like, she's got to be a good doctor if all of these doctors and nurses and techs and secretaries keep showing up every day to see her. And then they, you know, they see them give you a hug when they walk in or whatever. They they see that. They register that. They don't understand the medicine, but they know, wow, this is a doctor that... Beloved by really, the community. Yeah. yeah. beloved. And that plays into it. So it, it was a very, it was very interesting. So yes, the second trial was a completely, was very different from the first trial, but not because, well, no, I, I mean, I testified really well. Also, my attorney then said, you know, I went from being one of the worst <laughs> defendants he's ever had to maybe being in like the top, the insurer. Oh, he wouldn't give it to you. Him. He wouldn't say He wouldn't best. give me wouldn't. the oh. top. He gave me top five. <laughs> he gave me top five, um, as did the, the insurance company exec who comes to see how things are going. Um, so he gave me, he gave me top five, but I felt like I did as well as I could possibly have done. And that was a good feeling. And you know, the jury, it's out of your hands. You get a sense though, as it goes on, you get a, you get a read, especially if it goes on for weeks, you get a sense of whether that jury thinks highly of you or not. It's just, I don't know the way they look at you. If they look at you in the hall, you're not supposed to talk to them. But you know, one day I was in a little bodega near the courtroom um, because like the first hour was the lawyers doing some sort of arguments and the jury wasn't supposed to be present and I didn't need to be present. So I just went and I got some coffee and a juror walked in and I was like, oh God, you know, I'm not supposed, I tried not to look at him. And he walked right by and he was like, good morning, doctor. And he gave me a big smile and I was like, good morning, you know, try to give a smile back. And then when he walked out, I was like, oh, I got that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you, I mean, you get a sense and of course you need, a, you know, more than one uh, to be on your side in this, but um that is a whole other really bizarre and interesting thing that I could talk about for hours, but <laughs> that whole dynamic. So when when all was said and done, whether and I'm not really sure when I'm asking about, but whether it's at the beginning when you found out that there was going to be a lawsuit, or even before that when you found out that there was an adverse outcome, did your practice style change? Because it sounds to me like it may have at the beginning. But then through the whole process, you've kind of come to terms with everything and understand really the backstory. So, so maybe in the, at the beginning it did and, the, and in the end it didn't. But what, what's the answer? Did your practice style change at all? A little bit. I, I think a little bit. In the very beginning, it's interesting. And I've heard a lot of doctors say this too. The thing that you're sued about is the thing that you can't be objective about. And so for me you know, neurologic things, young people with neurosymptoms. I was just, I dreaded those cases. But I have to say that intellectually, I don't think it changed my actual practice. It just changed me on the inside. I was just so much more worried. I was scared. I may have practiced a little more defensively, but I really did still try to be a good doctor who stuck to guidelines. Now, the first trial was all about whether or not I ordered an MRI on somebody and so if I was hedging about, do I order an MRI or not? You could bet which side I was going to land on. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I, I don't think that my, you know, we're, as doctors, I think we're all really good at hiding our emotions from patients. We, we learn how to do that, right? That's just kind of part of how we grow up in medicine is you learn how to put on your professional veneer you know, you could be involved in something really terrible, you know, in the emergency department, I can walk out of a, a, a two-year-old who, you know, who had a code and died. And now I got to go take care of this person with influenza who feels like they're dying um, and is mad about the weight. But what do I do? I, I put on my professional veneer and I put all that stuff away. And then I say, hi, I'm Dr. Pensa. I'm sorry you've been waiting, but how can I help you today? What's going on, right? We do that all the time. And so I was still doing that. I was really conflicted and bruised on the inside, but I still knew how to be a good doctor. 
So I was still doing that, but I was on the inside. There was certainly a lot of consternation. I, you know, was really tempted to be defensive all the time. But interestingly, I think, you know, in the intervening decade, what has happened to me and has also happened to a number of physicians that I feel like are kind of on the other side is that if they've, if they've made it through it whole, and some people don't, but if they've made it through it whole and they're choosing to still practice medicine, the thing that tends to save us, I think, is savoring the human relationships in medicine. Like when I, you know, when I lecture about, I, I do lectures about, about litigation and kind of finding yourself afterwards and coming back from it. And I talk about this journey sort of back to loving medicine again. And I, you know, still on any given day, I may have a love-hate relationship with medicine, but getting back to the port where I, where I was happy that I was a doctor again, a lot of it was focusing on very small things that were human things, human interactions, alleviation of suffering, holding someone's hand, being kind. I, at some point, read this essay about, and I wish I could remember who wrote it. I'm not even sure anymore, but it was in some you know, these newspapers, medical newspapers that, that we get. And um, it was about, it was an essay about the spiritual satisfaction about caring for the least of society that, you know, we do in emergency medicine. We care for the chronic alcoholics, the schizophrenics, the people without access to care otherwise, who you may be the kindest voice they hear all day. And that there was something redeeming about that. And I cut that out and I carried it around with me in my white coat for a while, just as a sort of talisman and a reminder of, of what really mattered in medicine and that what I did was important. And going through that exercise and really finding a way to appreciate what I did on a daily basis, that has changed me as a doctor. You know, I'm not always looking for the big trauma resuscitation. I am so much more about the human interactions I have with my patients. And I think that makes me a better doctor. So I, I think that I'm probably a better doctor now than I was. I'm probably not as fast as I was, um, but I also don't care as much about that. I know I'm being metriced to death and I used to be super fast. And I, you know what? I'm not that super fast anymore. And people may be waiting to see me a little bit. And hopefully by the time I'm done with them, they're okay with having waited to see me. Uh, so yeah, I'm different. But in some ways, I'm better, I think. Yeah, I don't know if you'd be able to go to work every day being thinking, yeah, I'm a little worse than I was. I'm not as uh, not as thorough and uh, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I think people are afraid that's going to happen to them. Yeah. You know? There is a yeah. period of time, I think, where your confidence is shaken. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think it'd be possible. You wouldn't be human to avoid something like that. No. And you'll you'll tend to be a little more defensive and, and the whole scenario yes. will make you nervous, but you're still going to perform. That's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I had an adverse outcome and was subject to a lawsuit that uh, was ended up being thrown out with, uh, I think with prejudice is the term, the legal term that they use. Mm -hmm. But it, it changed the way I document because now I know there are going to be people that are reading my notes that maybe don't understand what I say when I mean this mm -hmm. or what I, what I mean, you know, uh, I, I end up phrasing things differently because I think, well, let's say this ends up having to be reviewed by an expert witness who's not an ENT. Right. That, you know, it may end up going to trial because they don't understand what I mean when I say X. So now I have to say right. Y. So. And you can go too far with that. Yeah. You know, I think it's certainly in, you know, documentation, something we can talk about for another hour. But I think that there is a happy medium in there. You know, you can't, there are people I know who have gone through this. There's a, someone I work with who really had a terrible, terrible case and a terrible thing happened to him and through no fault of his own. But, after being under that microscope for so long, like he can't, he can't stop charting. Like yeah. he's there three hours extra every day, dictating these enormously long. Yeah, I mean, they're wonderful if you get the patient again later and you can read his thing. Like they're all, they're like infectious disease notes. They're great. <laughs> Novella. <laughs> but he spends a lot of his life charting. You know, you can you can swing that pendulum too far. And so I'm, you know, it's it's interesting. I've gotten to this point where I'm like, you know, I'm going to chart. The things that I think are important, I'll put in a little bit of like a little bit of my MDM when I'm thinking, but I don't, I think that pendulum has swung back for me too. I think I was, I, I was an overcharter briefly. Yeah. Now I'm kind of back to just kind of doing my thing. I mean, mostly because I think at this point I realize that 
yeah, your chart's important. Do not let me say that the chart is not important or imply in any way that the chart is not important. The chart is going to be so important through this whole thing. But if you chart decently and you can testify as to, you know, your reasoning is plain uh, and it shows... Yeah, you don't need to have so many caveats in yes, there that like, oh, well, well if the, this happens and that it's happens... It's not going to help you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. going to help you. Like, that's in fact, it may end up looking positive. defensive. Yes, yes. And so you just, you know, yeah. you just want to let shine through that you were thoughtful about this. You, you spent time with the patient that you thought about these things and this is why you think X. And you basically just want, as with everything what really should shine through is that you cared about this person when you were taking care of them, that you thought about them, you thought about their presentation, you spent some time with them, you did what you were supposed to do, and uh, and then you did X. And, and just in case the person after you, the doctor that takes care of this patient next is not you, please just make it in such a way that we know what happened. That's yes. just... That's yes. all I want. Yes. All I want is yes. for my partner's notes too. Yes, It'd be right. Nice exactly. If I could like, have some it. like little prose section where I can just have a little summary. Just I know. What, I, what I, I, I'm, I'm with on. that with my I mean, emergency medicine yeah. notes. Sometimes you know you sort of my residents will write this note and then they'll just say you know I'm going to do this 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 and this and then it's done and then you know you recognize like okay well what happened yeah <laughs> it's not in there. One of my mentors once said, you document for three reasons. You document for billing, you document for medical legal reasons, and you document for, for, for the care of the patient. So if, as long as you've said enough that the next person does what happened, mm-hmm. you have all the information you need to bill appropriately, and you know it covers you a little bit in case of litigation, then you've documented appropriately. Do not document beyond that because then yes. you're just wasting your time and everybody's You're just wasting your time. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's, that's sound advice. Was there anything that you learned from the podcast that you, and the answer might be no, that you hadn't learned from your trial, given your trials? Yes. Yes. Well, first of all, I hadn't known before I started talking to people. The third podcast is all about one physician's case where in the end they make a, a good, solid effort to to go after his personal assets. And I I thought that, that was ridiculously rare. Like I knew about people like losing a trial and this and that, but I didn't realize to what extent that was used as leverage. And I'm hearing more and more about that, which is terrifying, but we we get into that a little bit. Um, I had never heard of a high-low agreement. That never came up in my trial. And so in the podcast that I'm doing now about trial and settlement, we get into what is what is a high-low agreement? How do plaintiffs and defense attorneys hedge their bets uh, beforehand. Uh, You know, I didn't know about some of these other sort of agreements. I did get a good sense the second time around. I think a lot of people don't get how much of litigation is, um, not only how little of it is related to medicine, but how much of it is really sort of backroom dealings. And it matters who the judge is and it matters who the attorneys are. And uh, you get a and sense- it matters of- when the trial is. Is <laughs> it in the morning or the afternoon? Did they? Did the judge eat a good lunch? Because yeah. that changes outcomes. <laughs> these things change their outcomes. There, We go through the story, Dr. Dr. M, uh, who is the one that I was calling a vigilante before, he talks about his case and how he did everything. You know, well, he's had five cases, but particular case that we talk about, like he, there's not a thing he could have done differently for this poor person. And he's the one who's named in the suit. And then the, the whole thing winds up getting there. They're telling him that they're going to lose a trial because of the judge and his relationship with the uh, plaintiff's attorney and that the, who the plaintiff's attorney is. And he's from this prominent family and the judge is trying to get a, um, a new judgeship. I forget what level of court it was, but it depended on, you know, who you know. And so, you know, that judge was never going to let you know, the defense side win in this scenario. So there is a lot of stuff that goes along, that goes on that, you know, we as physicians are <laughs> supposed to, you know, we don't think like that. We don't think like that. We're not networkers. We don't, you know, what our job is doesn't depend on who we know and who we curry favor with. And, you know, it doesn't. Uh, We don't think like that. So just, I I, I got a sense of that during my own trials, but then hearing these stories of people just telling me about what happened just really kind of drove that point home. Just how Um, deep it goes. Yeah. And so I think I learned a lot. I've learned a lot. It's been a couple of years since I've been doing these interviews with physicians and it's just, I mean, the scope of the way things are in different states, you know, and it's been interesting talking to people about their own personal ways of coping and what their lawyers were like. And, you know, you have your own lived experience, but when you think about how often this is happening to other people, 
uh, and what their experiences were like, it, it completely broadened my understanding of of what happens um, to doctors going through this. And you know, certainly I'm not alone. My experience is not singular in any way. But you know, what's the? I'm I'm losing the. I'll come up with it as soon as we stop talking. But in the book, there's a quote that you know, you know, every happy family is the same and every unhappy family is like they're they're unhappy in their own way in their own like unique way it's sort of like that like every one of these stories is similarly unhappy but they have their own unique aspects about why they're unhappy yeah devil's in the details i guess yeah so i yes i definitely learned a lot and and hopefully that will be translated to people who are listening to the podcast speaking of which where where can people find the podcast doctors and litigation the l word yes i think if you just search for doctors and litigation the l word um and my name gita pensa you will find it in it's an apple podcast it's on spotify it is on podbean is where it's hosted and so that's um, the l word.podbean.com and I, yeah, but if you just search for doctors and litigation, the L word, you will find it. Dr. Keita Pensa, thank you so much. This has been a great conversation. I appreciate your having me so much. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on The Physician's Guide to Doctoring.